So with that, I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Richard T. Olson, Director of the U.S. National Arboretum. Dr. Olson will be talking about the delayed value of plant introductions to American gardens, and perhaps providing a little inspiration to all of us as we start thinking about our spring gardens. Dr. Olson has been serving <clears throat> as Director of the U.S. National Arboretum since 2015. He originally joined the National Arboretum as a research geneticist focusing on the urban tree breeding program after receiving his PhD in horticultural science from North Carolina State University. <laughs> in 2010, Dr. Olson became the lead scientist for the Arboretum Germplasm Program. He served as both the acting director of the Arboretum and the acting assistant director of the USDA's Agricultural Research Service, Beltsville Agricultural Research Center. This experience provided Dr. Olson the unique opportunity to understand and appreciate the Arboretum, and especially its potential as a premier national and an international scientific institution. And as FONA is the Arboretum's primary private partner, we work very closely with Dr. Olson and his staff, and together we make a really good team supporting the mission of the Arboretum. So Dr. Olson, it is great to see you and thank you for joining us. And I will hand it over to you now. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, and Kathy, thank you for uh, the introduction and thank you for the invite to, <laughs> to speak on this subject. So full disclosure, this is a, a talk that I put together for um, the International Plant Propagator Society meeting. It was a sort of a keynote um, talk for that meeting last fall. And in putting that talk together, I, my original purpose was to focus on sort of the breakthrough breeding moments, those aha moments that make possible, that are made possible by traits that are residing in, in less celebrated or forgotten or even discarded plant selections, species, or even entire genera that uh, for whatever reason, uh, American horticulture, global horticulture, the nursery industry has not really embraced or is not using. Um, and so, and the fact that this is all made possible by institutions like the United States National Arboretum. So this was, again, advocacy for what we do at the National Arboretum, where we exist for the, the collection, characterization, documentation, uh, preservation, and ultimately distribution or utilization of great plant material from our collections uh, and getting them into the, the end users. Uh, not all botanical institutes exist to do that. Uh, so you'll hear a little bit about that. Uh, again, as I repeat some of my stories, if you all have heard me, uh, I apologize. You'll hear some themes that are, are that uh, run through all my talks. You'll see some of that again. But, um, and we have a lot of great institutions though that do that. So this is also not just an Arboretum talk on what we do uh, per se, but this is really, uh, about the uh, the role of these plants in in American horticulture. So, again, in pondering this, the idea from going from a curio, a plant that is really cool, you may have it as a collector, but really, the industry doesn't really utilize it. You know, no one grows it; uh, it's discarded. And how it may go from a champion, um, and and that's not the norm for most plants. Not all plants will go from a curio. The champion. It is not pre preordained destiny that all plants are cool or that all plants will be utilized by the industry. Because most plants, and even plant introductions, they sort of settle in this middling ground where maybe they're hyped in the beginning, uh, especially nowadays as we have branding uh, and intellectual property invested in, 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 in plant breeding programs where there's a lot of hype and pull through marketing. Uh, and maybe you're excited about it for a while and then over time, reality sort of sets in and you realize, wow, that was maybe a little bit more hype than, uh, than it was worth. And then you have those plants that don't ever get hype or never maybe um, were grown a long time ago and are forgotten. And then over time, people start to realize how cool and how great these plants actually are, sort of doers in the landscape. And they sort of persist. So they come up to sort of this middle ground. Uh, and then you throw on top of this, the changing cultural norms, right? So fads and fashions change, uh, the uh, societal changing social values sort of have impact on our landscapes when they come into our gardening world in terms of a choice of plant material. Uh, and then of course, obviously the vagaries of environment, 
uh, pests and disease uh, and, uh, and increasingly climate change, uh, will take a plant and knock it off its pedestal when a new disease or pest comes through. So really the point of this talk is all of these plants have some inherent value and they may simply be waiting for someone uh, uh, with vision to redeploy them, or you're waiting for some new treat, trait to be discovered that turns a plant from a uh, forgotten relic to uh, incredible mainstay in the industry. So a champion, from curio to champion. Sorry, I'm hitting my slides and they're not moving. So let me try a different. My slide hasn't changed, I apologize. I'm doing everything, Claire. Oh, there we go. It was slow. It was slow. All right, there we go. It's caught up. So I apologize. Okay, so, oh my gosh, why is Dr. Olson talking about Don Redwood? Well, bear with me here. Uh, the whole talk is not about Don Redwood, but it's very interesting to, to, to talk about this path from Curio the Champion because my vote for the fastest that it has ever been done in the history of, of horticulture is with the Dawn Redwood. And, and the thing to remember, the story is pretty well characterized. It's been updated, by the way. If you think you know the story, there's some new references sort of clarifying some things. But in short, discovered in 1938 as fossils, 41, they finally described the fossil genus, and this is a scientist in Japan. Then in 1941, at the same time in China, unknowingly, New uh, living plants of a new conifer are found. 43, they take herbarium specimens. 46, it's not until the living stuff is matched up with the fossil stuff and we have this aha moment. And then in 47 and 48 is the famous distribution out of China after World War II, orchestrated through Arnold R. Reedham, but also the, the Missouri Botanical Garden. Uh, and in 1948, the species is officially described. And so you take this plant that and, and really uh, in a matter of discovery from the living plants, let's say, uh, 150 million euro Mesozoic conifer that wasn't even known in 38 becomes a worldwide sensation by 1948. Now, so that's less than 10 years. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the National Arboretum was part of those uh, organizations that received plants early on. And so we have a a mixture in the, in the Gatelli collection and, and other places of the original distribution. There's some propagules mixed in there. But what's funny is that by 1958, so now we're 20 years from fossil discovery, only 10 years from the seed being distributed, uh, Francis DeVos and others at the National Arboretum make a selection uh, out of that original seed batch distributed from China uh, in 58, and it's released in 1963 as national. And so we have a sort of a hedge of them on campus and then around the administration building, you will see this clone. So think about that. 150 million years old conifer that no one even knew about went to a commercial success in 20, 25 years. Now, for those of you who are in horticulture will say, well, was it really a commercial success? Well, the species, yes. The clone national uh, is pretty much not found in the trade. Uh, these are also original distributions at the uh, Missouri Botanical Garden. And so the tree on the left is the one that has in the last uh, decade or so been uh, named and released after Peter Raven, uh, the director there forever, uh, emeritus, great friend of the National Arboretum, uh, uh, Raven or Shaw's legacy, Shaw who started the, the, um, the Missouri Botanical Garden. But again, this is what you're looking for, right? So this here's the nursery industry saying, this is an incredibly shaped uh, tree, uniform, fits into production practices. So now you have something that's really a cultivar that's going to be a champion. So the species is, is everywhere. It's a common component of, of the landscapes. It's an amazing, amazing, cool plant. But now you have a selection. Uh, and so national is sort of cast off. Our selection is actually a curio. I don't know if I've ever seen it actually ever uh, in the trade. Uh, and so the nurserymen have gotten a hold of this and they're, they're, they recognize the value. And so now they're refining the species uh, and creating even more champions. And so this is Jade Prince, which is a newer introduction from J. Frank Schmidt, famous nursery, tree nursery on the West Coast. Uh, and so again, now we're getting, unfortunately, what we, we see in the urban environment, people like more, ever more compact uh, and symmetrical trees. And so whether or not you like this type of thing, this will be a, a commercial success as a Dawn Redwood that sort of fits in a more 
uh, restrained urban environment. But not all Dawn Redwoods, of course, are champions. And this is a funny because uh, I got to see this original plant in, um, in the, the Netherlands in 2007. Well, actually, I think we brought some back and there was already one here at the Arboretum. But this is a cultivar called Vossland, uh, which is kind of a witch's broom or compact thing. Um, and it's a pretty ugly tree. Uh, and so this is definitely a curio, but this is why we collect them. You put them in the collection because you never know. Maybe someone will have a, a be more optimistic and have greater vision uh, than me as a tree breeder and say there's an opportunity here to use this dwarf or compact trait for the next generation of Don Redwood. So in a nutshell, the National Arboretum, this is what we do historically have done. We're a collections-based research institute in public arboretum. You all know that. Um, and uh, there's our mission. I think I'll skip over that a little bit because I think I recognize a lot of voices, uh, although I guess I shouldn't. But this is why we exist. Um, is to enhance the economic, environmental, and aesthetic value of, of our landscapes. Uh, and through this long-term research, right, we, we have secure federal funding uh, that allows us to, to do the work that our industry partners or academic partners necessarily maybe not uh, can't do. So we're in the business of long-term high risk. And to put it another way, because I know with FONO and the Fairchild Society, which is is a wonderful group for those of you who are, uh, are part of that. Thank you for your support, the FONA and the National Arboretum. But the vision of the National Arboretum was really laid out by, by David Fairchild. And he wrote this in the first PI book, 1898. He wrote, a garden for economic work should possess many species secured from as many localities as possible and a collection of varieties, varieties which may prove of more importance than a collection of different species. The point here was, we were in the business of economic work. We were an economic garden. We're not a curio collection, a Victorian collection of you have something because it's pretty, but we have something because it may be of use to the American farmer, or it may have potential for people trying to solve those problems to the, the American farmer. So diversifying the palates of both our plates uh, and our gardens. And so we take that very serious. I take that very seriously at the National Arboretum as uh, we're doing it. We're really an economic garden. But that doesn't mean we can't do both, uh, be aesthetic uh, and, and, and meet the needs, uh, ever-growing needs of, a, of an urban green space. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, when you look at this, this is a shot of our maple garden from through the spruce field, our maple collection. This is what we do. We explore, we collect, we propagate, document, characterize, verify, distribute, utilize, and preserve. So this, this is not a static collection, um, but our scientists and our staff are curating uh, an amazingly scientific uh, and important collection. And if you look at that maple collection, kind of in the middle, uh, there's a little orange tree in there along with the other ones, but uh, it's the tree here in the middle now, but I'm, I'm gonna focus on that because we do this for posterity. We've been doing this for almost a hundred years because it takes that long sometimes for the value of your collections to come in. And so this is part of this journey I've been talking about, the Shantung maple, uh, Acer truncatum, I love this one because it was introduced by uh, Frank Meyer, uh, or at least he has an introduction uh, of uh, Acer truncatum. Uh, did really well out west at Chico at one of our original plant introduction stations. Uh, got passed around. Um, here you see a tree on the right is actually, that's the 40th uh, degree latitude in Beijing. It's the same latitude as, as, Pens as Philadelphia. But in the middle are actually offshoots or seedlings of, of Meyer's original introductions or plants we received from Glendale and Chico. And so for 90 years, almost nothing was going on with this species. Um, and on, uh, sorry, one other shot. If you want to see an original tree, I thought we had one, uh, but I've removed it. It's a different plant. But anyways, this is at the Morris Arboretum. So for those of you who are familiar with Morris Arboretum, they have an original Frank Meyer introduction of this species, and there it is. Um, but it took 90 years before the conditions were right when the, the utility uh, and the usefulness of this species came along. So you had enterprising uh, researchers like Nina Bas uh, Basic up at Cornell doing provenance and uh, germplasm screening studies. Uh, and then you had nurserymen starting to look at it. And the beauty of this tree really is this is a maple that gets fall color that you can grow in Davis, California uh, or Austin, Texas as well as Philadelphia and, and, and Boston. So you had this really widely adapted tree species. 
And it really came into its own when people started saying, hey, time out. Maybe we shouldn't be growing Norway maple anymore because it's so invasive. This is a close relative to Norway maple. And so close, in fact, that the two trees on your right uh, or the screen right um, are actually um, hybrids between Acer truncatum and Acer uh, platinoides introduced by J. Frank Schmidt Nursery again. Uh, my favorite is sort of the, the tree that you see a nice rounded canopy of. This is Main Street selected from Worthington Farms in North Carolina. It's a really great. Uh, and then the fire dragon was actually one of the first ones. We have both of these at the National Arboretum from the, uh, from the originators. Uh, and so I like to talk about Meyer, and Meyer is a really good example of, of this delayed value uh, that some species have in introduction. So uh, Frank Meyer, of course, is one of the collectors for David Fairchild that went out. Unfortunately, he, he did pass away about 1917, 1918. Uh, and so he doesn't get the credit that people like E.H. Wilson, Chinese Wilson gets uh, in ornamental world at least because he was doing agronomic crops as well as uh, ornamental crops. But the first plant introduction station that really opened in the U.S. for this uh, stuff was coming through Chico, California. And so if I just take this one year and illustrate the species that he sent uh, and then talk about where we are 100 years, I hope to give you a little bit of a picture of this path that some plants take from Curio to uh, champion. So in 1908, he sent plants back uh, to Chico. And they included, uh, if you can, you can see the original PI book there, but you can see my notes on the side. They in included Viburnum macrocephalum sterile, which is the, the giant Chinese snowball viburnum. Classic plant. It was originally introduced by Robert Fortune uh, uh, in, in England, at least. Uh, but probably ours is a reintroduction and what we have in the US could come from that uh, source or from, from Frank Meyer. You also have Chinese holly that was in this group. This is Ilex cornuta. This is a mainstay in the nursery industry. So we'll talk about Ilex cornuta. And then yes, for a lot of people, they don't realize this, uh, in that same shipment was Loripedalum chinensis. So the Chinese fringe flower, uh, which exploded in popularity in the 1990s was actually introduced this uh, to the United States in 1908. So uh, again, incredible, just this is just one shipment of Frank Meyer that, that he sent to us. So, so let's take a little bit of a deeper dive there into this group. Uh, and so there we are. There is, uh, in case you didn't know what I was talking about, on the left is Viburnum macrocephalum sterile. This is the giant snow, Chinese snowball Viburnum, first introduced actually as this form. So we didn't actually have the fertile form. These are double flowers, kind of like a, a sort of like a mop head hydrangea, so to speak. Uh, and so there's really no fertile flowers in there. So if you want to do something with this plant, grow uh, seedlings or offspring, you have to have a fertile form. Well, this form was actually introduced, like I said, uh, uh, if you read the notes from Frank Meyer, it's interesting. Uh, it was actually grafted on the species. So so I say that uh, for the plant people here because uh, the species, we were looking for the species for plant improvement, especially at the National Arboretum with Don Egos Viburnum program. He really wanted to get fertile material of this species. But when he started his program in the 50s at Cornell and took it to the National Arboretum, that material didn't exist in cultivation. We couldn't improve it. Uh, so it wasn't until 1980 uh, as part of the SABE trip that the National Arboretum helped organize to China the first in China for North American scientists uh, expedition since essentially before World War II. Uh, this plant was recollected by Dr. Dudley uh, of the National Arboretum and the Herbarium uh, and introduced. And so now on the right, you see the species type, the wild type that was then immediately, essentially, I guess, incorporated uh, by Don Egoff into the plant breeding program. So it wasn't, and there you go, there's the fruits uh, that you can see on this species, which would not have been seen in this country until after 1980. Uh, it led to uh, some breeding and ultimately Dr. Pooler's introduction of Nantucket viburnum, which is uh, a cross with that fertile form. So Nantucket was the first new genetics uh, for this species uh, since its introduction in the United States. Now, uh, it's such a good plant that we have copycat uh, folks or people that build on that. And so you'll see in the trade now at least two introductions from Dr. Michael Durr, University of Georgia. This is prolific, and I do need to thank him for, for the image because I don't have an image of it. 
but this is basically an open pollinated seedling off of Nantucket. And he has another one called spring fleece. Um, this one is more evergreen, spring fleece is less. And Nantucket should be, if I remember correctly, essentially deciduous. So flowers a little earlier and fragrant. But the point is, is sort of that, that dam was broke uh, because of the plant exploration and introduction. And so you took a plant that was immediately successful, a champion, but only as a clone, uh, as this, the mop head. And now we have this opened up these new world of genetics. Uh, and so that's a, that was a champion from the beginning. It's still a champion today. Uh, but then we have other things that maybe aren't uh, anymore. And so, or at least in a different form. So now we're switching over to Chinese holly. And uh, Chinese holly is Ilex cornuta. And now I grew up in the South and landscaped with things like Ilex cornuta rotunda, uh, or, and up here you would see Burford holly or dwarf Burford holly. Uh, so those cultivars of Chinese holly have been a mainstay for a really long time. Uh, again, introduced uh, by the USDA several times. Frank Meyer uh, introduced uh, clones of it or seed of it, and then USDA in the 1920s. It's a little, Stefan Laura is going to corner me probably, and someone else may. Um, it's a little confusing because there was some material in the United States before that, but not a lot of it. Uh, most of the selections we have date to the USDA introductions. And so they were growing seed of this. And this is, I show this because this is a famous um, historic planting at uh, Jungle Gardens on Avery Island. This is the estate garden of E.A. McElhaney of Tabasco Fortune. Uh, he was uh, worked very closely with the USDA, basically as a very Southern plant station, uh, introduction station. Tremendous amount of PI USDA material growing here because it was one of the warmest tropical, subtropical places in the United States. Uh, and he planted out a mile hedge of this species from seed um, that he received from the USDA. And this is, this is now that hedge. You can actually drive underneath it. So this is all spiny, bedeviled, if you see in the corner there, Ilex cornuta. And uh, so when it first came in, it was being sold, but there was no, there was no selections. Uh, and uh, the first time it can see commercially sold was a famous nursery in uh, Augusta. And for the golf people here, you will know this. Uh, this is Fruitland Nurseries, but this is where the Masters is played now. So the clubhouse was the mansion of the nursery. And so, um, but Fruitland Nursery was the nursery uh, in the South, but also in the United States from the late 18, uh, 1850s, starting 1858 all the way to 1918, I believe is when it operates. So this is near the end, uh, but they offer an Ilex Cornuta that they said came from uh, Wilson, which is interesting. So again, just seedling grown material. And uh, when you get flash forward uh, uh, to the 1950s and H.H. H. Hume, who wrote a book on hollies, who was on the board of advisors for the National Arboretum, uh, he said that, hey, look, everyone is really excited about this. There's seedlings everywhere. Beware for, um, be on the lookout for new introductions. Jungle Gardens, E.A. McElhaney, they introduced at least uh, a half a dozen uh, by the 1950s and later one of which uh, Anisette de Cambrier or, or Needlepoint or, or Willow Leaf, depending on who you talk to, uh, is still out there in the trade. Also Rotunda, the famous Rotunda, and we have plants of Rotunda from McElhaney at our Morrison Garden. Uh, he introduced Rotunda, which is still a mainstay. The sport off of that is Carissa, which is a mainstay. Um, and I think I'm missing one more from them. But uh, uh, the famous uh, Southern garden writer from UNC, William Lanier Hunt, uh, wrote by uh, 1980s. He said, uh, at one time, it seemed like every other year there was a, a, a couple of cultivars of Ilex cornuta coming out, and now you don't see any. So Ilex cornuta had that path of building up excitement, got a lot of cultivars, and then people are like, wow, these are pretty thorny, pretty boring, pretty turned into commercial plants. Let's find something more exciting. And so what has happened is that species uh, is now a champion for another reason. And, and that is because it has been used in a lot of hybrid and uh, breeding programs, including the National Arboretum. We have a, several uh, introductions uh, from using Ilex cornuta, uh, uh, Adonis, Coronet, Miniature, and Venus. Uh, even the famous Nellie R. Stevens holly, which is a mainstay 
Uh, its parent was a female Ilex cornuta growing at the U.S. Botanical Garden of all places around the turn of the century. Uh, and so it keeps, this is the gift that keeps on giving in terms of genetics. So the species is not so utilized anymore other than some cultivars, but really in genetics. This is um, a, a cultivar that was introduced by our neighbors, Y, y Nursery in, in, in Maryland. Um, I don't think it's gone very far, but it's basically uh, a Nellie R. Stevens seedling. See the twist in there that comes from Ilex cornuta anyways. Uh, so again, still this gift keeps going, but now instead of the species, we see it's the genetics, it's the species. Uh, it's the genetics that, that is interesting. So um, another plant from Frank Meyer's shipment in 1908, Lord Pedlum Chinense. Now uh, re recall, I gave this talk at, at Southern Region IPPS, which was down in Athens, Georgia, and this was at, uh, hosted by UGA. This was sort of a a hurrah for a, a, a generation of um, professors like Dr. Durr and Dr. Armitage. Um, and so it was a really big, fun event to be back in the South and talk about this because, um, and, and, the, and sort of say, hey, look, do you realize that a lot of this stuff was going on for a long time? So I sort of was challenging some of them on purpose on this, on what they actually think they know about some of these species. So Lord Penham Chinese Snow Panda was actually one of the first I think it may have been the second introduction of just the white flowered Lord Pelham chinense. Even though this species was introduced in 1908 to the United States, don't know how long it took to get established. Um, but in the South, um, you don't see old specimens of this. So you can go in the gardens and you're, you're always stumbling around stuff that you can find. But for, in, my, in all of my travels in the South, I never saw an old specimen of Laura Pelham Chinense that you would expect if it was around for 100 years. So I mentioned this at the talk and, and thankfully said, hey, look, have anyone seen anything? And the, the, the unanimous answer uh, was that there are several uh, old specimens around Mobile. And the reason was there was a Japanese diaspora there of nurserymen at the turn of the century. Uh, and so apparently there are old um, loripedalum, white loripedalums in the South. But anyways, I tell you that because this is, uh, when did we introduce this, Margaret? And, uh, it came out of a collection in 1994 in Wudongshan, um, no, Hubei, uh, and then uh, introduced in 2006, right? So this is on the heels of, of, the, of a flurry of introductions in red, in red flowered um, cultivars. And so it's hard to believe for those that are out there that there was a time uh, in American horticulture when you did not have a pink or purple or red flowered Laura Petalum. Uh, and really the National Arboretum is really to blame for some of this. Um, and I don't mean blame, but uh, we had a great role in this uh, because uh, in the 1980s, we were part of the, of the group that brought in uh, some of these newfound uh, red uh, forms uh, from Japan and from China. So today, uh, for, for when I was an undergraduate. So, uh, we have now, when you look at one of the treated, Larry Hatch's uh, New Ornamental Society, uh, which is a, a reference we use, there's over 60 cultivars of Laura Pedlum in that have been named. So we went from no cultivars in the late 80s to over 60 in 2023. One of those early ones was Zuzal Fuchsia, which Bradley has done a, a great job espaliating this uh, on, on the building. And so the question is, what happened? Uh, I apologize uh, sort of for this slide. This is an actual slide I took as a student. That's Dr. Michael Durr in a stopping traffic in Aiken, South Carolina to take a picture. This would have been in the late 90s uh, of, a, of an early planting of Lord Pedalum. So this, the introductions were successful, right? It's now a mainstay and being planted in urban plantings in small town America. So uh, how did we get there? Well, what we have to acknowledge um, is that the red form of Laura Petalum was described botanically in the 1930s. So we knew, or you should have known, or others should have known that this red form existed. So, um, but it wasn't until the 1980s 
uh, that it was rediscovered by Chinese on a mountain on Daiwai Mountain. Uh, and since that time in the 1980s, the excitement for this species, um, it has really been cemented in China um, as an important species for them. Uh, and it's actually a focus of an entire Chinese economy uh, and a germ bank, a germplasm, uh, a germplasm bank and collection just for Loripetum. Um, and so um, the Japanese knew about this. We worked a lot with Japanese nurserymen. They had their contacts in China. We didn't have a lot in the early 80s. Remember, China hadn't opened up for Americans yet, uh, for the most part. And so the Japanese were, were bringing these forms in, and then we were getting them from the Japanese. Uh, and so uh, this notion of um, a, a little sub theme here, I want to point out if you haven't picked it up on, the Chinese have been doing horticulture a really long time. Uh, and so they have been making selections. And so, um, you know, the, the, the future in terms of plants from China is not a remote, necessarily a remote mountainside uh, in Yunnan, it's a nursery in uh, Jiangsu. So um, again, we, great genetic resources. They know they have great genetic resources. Uh, and um, so the Japanese were taking advantage of this. And in the 1990s, there was a flood uh, of material in and continues to this day. Now, uh, again, we have more than 60 cultivars. So a plant that was introduced in 1880 in England, 1908 in the United States, essentially no cultivars or selections until uh, the 1980s and all of those were imported. Uh, and then now we have 62. The one that I, I joked about here was because I was once asked, Richard, will you ever see a white flowered red foliage form of Laura Pedlum? And I said, well, I don't think you'll see it. Uh, those genes have got to be so closely linked that breaking them uh, will be like one in a billion odds. And then sure enough, don't ever say that because uh, here you have jazz uh, or ruby snow, white flowered on red, red foliage. I thought that would never happen. So, uh, and then jazz hands is a, is a new one. I took this again, forgive me with Dr. Durr, but we were down there and this was sort of his territory. So I thought it was interesting that by 2023, he's not even paying attention to Laura Pedalum. He's on to something else. That's how saturated the Laura Pedalum market is. So I want to come back to um, Frank Meyer's 1908 uh, shipment and show you the next page. I only talked about three of them, but this one is really all about lilacs. And of course, at the Arboretum, we have worked with lilacs, uh, um, but lilacs have been an important part of, uh, of, of horticulture coming from uh, Syringa vulgaris and the European selections and our, our, our background uh, in Eastern North America. And then uh, even to uh, the, the need for Southern heat tolerant lilacs. Uh, most lilacs, if you grew up with it, um, like the vulgaris, like the, the French lilacs, they require chilling hours. Uh, they don't like the heat of the South because they don't get enough chilling hours. And so uh, there's a host of factors there. And so there's always a search for more lilacs and lilacs that um, to this day will um, grow in the South because Zone seven is one of the largest markets for horticultural products in the United States. It used to be zone five, but the Bible Belt has developed after World War II. And so heat tolerant plants for the South was important. So you go back to 1908, and in this one introduction, you have uh, Syringa oblata, which is the, the late lilac. Uh, and you actually have both forms of it that were known. You had a purple form and a white form, and I'll come back to that. And you also have a species. And now, again, if there are lilac experts here, forgive me. We know that this section of lilacs is confusing taxonomically. So just bear with me for the story. But you have what is known as Syringa myri, which was actually, uh, when it was introduced, was unknown. Uh, Meyer didn't name it after himself. Uh, and it was subsequently uh, named after him. So I want to point out that uh, the white form of Syringa oblata that was mentioned in this introduction by Frank Meyer also got passed around and people really liked it. And so thanks to uh, the keen eye of Stefan Laura and Margaret Poole and Joe Kirkbride, uh, they published a paper a while back uh, that solidified the name uh, of this, the cultivar name Frank and Meyer in honor of this white clone that has stood up over time and is loved by lilacs um, uh, aficionados and by using our plant breeding program. So they felt it deserved a no name. And so they named it after 
Franklin Meyer. So uh, an, another Arboretum connection. This is where that species grows. If you ever get to go north of, of Beijing, for instance, along the Great Wall, uh, some of that fall color is actually Syringa oblata. Uh, it does get um, great fall color. Korean form is variety dilatata or subspecies dilatata, which is also important. This is uh, on the left, a plant growing at the summer palace uh, when I was there in fall color in 2013. Uh, and on the right, you see one of the National Arboretum introductions, which is uh, includes the uh, Franken Meyer, the white form. Uh, so a plant introduced in 1908 ultimately gets introduced as a lilac in what was it, the late 1990s or early 2000s? I, I, I forgive, forgive me on that one. But again, it took a century, a century before his value was truly utilized. Also in that uh, planting was Syringa myri, this thing called Syringa myri. Now I knew this plant as a, a kid in the South because my mom, it was the only lilac we could grow in Raleigh, North Carolina to any satisfactory degree. Uh, it was tough as nails. And when you read that, it says it's tough as nails. Uh, it flowers. The fragrance is not like a, a, a French lilac. It's different section of the genus, but nonetheless, it is, it is fragrant. Um, if you're a purist, you might not like it. And you can stick with your French lilacs. You can't grow. But uh, uh, my eye is really important. So again, uh, we, it was introduced 1908. Uh, and it wasn't until, um, I got to get this straight. Bear with me for a second. Oh, I don't have it. So this pal palabin selection came about a little bit later, but nonetheless, this is a plant that Morton Arboretum uses as a hedge plant. It can be grown out on the Great Plains and it can be grown in Raleigh, North Carolina. Tough as nails plant. This is a plant that was, took time to become a champion, but it was a slow sort of start. Uh, people recognized that it was a doer in the landscape. And so you can actually go to Home Depot right now, uh, or maybe in the next two weeks, and you can pick this up for a rock bottom price uh, to this day at a big box store. Uh, and so that's not due to marketing um, because no one is, has any intellectual capital tied up into this. This is because it is a great landscape plant. I, I truly believe everyone should have Seringa Myri uh, Palavin. But again, not enough because the breeders know this. Uh, they've been working on this. This is uh, an image from my dear friend, Ryan Contreras, Dr. Contreras at Oregon State University. We were in school together. Uh, he's got a lilac breeding program. He's been working on this section of the, of the genus. He's using Syringa myri uh, palaban in his work. Others have used it uh, before as well. Uh, and what's interesting is it's in the background of some important hybrids that lead to remontancy in lilacs. That is lilacs that will rebloom. So the entire bloom meringue series of, uh, of lilacs actually get this trait and get uh, their toughness from Syringa myri Taliban in their, in their background. So here's a plant that has recreated our notion of what a lilac can be in a modern landscape using the genetics of a plant that was kicked around since 1908. So this is the future uh, of lilacs. Uh, and, you know, we had, we have a breeding program here uh, historically, uh, and uh, I can't speak to what crosses are being done anymore, but at the time we had a lot of germplasm. Ned Garvey went and collected a lot of lilac and supported the breeding program. And so if you go to our South Farm facility, which you can't go to unless you get invited or on, on a special trip. Uh, so, um, but this is where we have a lot of our germplasm uh, growing out is this form that I particularly like of Syringa velosa, which is sort of in that section of the genus. Uh, but this little plant is just a lovely little plant. I don't know if it's worth looking at closely, Todd, if you're on or Fred or Kevin uh, or Sue, uh, Margaret, but it's, it was, it's, a, it's a pretty stellar plant. And again, this may be the future of breeding. It may not ever get introduced, but uh, someone may request it and introduce it and use it in their breeding program and contribute. So uh, I'm getting closer uh, to the end, but I think I've still got time. So I do want to touch on, on boxwood as another example, uh, in, in particular because of our current efforts and where that sits, but also because there's, as usual, Frank Meyer uh, connection. So this is the Morrison Garden at the Arboretum and, and, and boxwood at the National Arboretum. Uh, so when I, um, some of the last breeding I was involved with uh, in germplasm was with boxwood. So um, when we started looking at this, the team started looking at this 
uh, we already had what you wanted, which was we had the national collection. It's the first national collection in, in the plant collection network. Um, it was, you know, game, game on, right? This is why we do this. We collect all these plants, we put them, we grow them, we evaluate them, and then all of a sudden we have a crisis. And the crisis is, is box blight, right? And so now we can deploy those resources. We can get in, roll up our sleeves, work with our partners in ARS and, uh, and other academic and industry partners and solve this problem for American landscape. So uh, we already had a great collection, uh, but we needed some more. There was some new collections. So we've been adding ever since. By the time I left, we, we looked at like 75 new ones. Um, there was a paper that was published, genetic diversity mapping, which really has informed the, the next steps. Uh, but our collection was sort of around just a handful of species of what we could grow. There's actually 20 species in China, uh, 90, uh, 90 species in the world, if I remember correctly. So box blight comes in in 2011. Let's get at it. Okay, so we're not going to talk about box blight. We're going to talk about this part of box blight, which the early research showed uh, that Buxus harlandii, uh, which is a, a somewhat of an obscure species, uh, at least in the U.S. from um, China, harbored the best sort of tolerance. It's not resistant, but it had the best sort of tolerance or resistance, we'll call it for this talk, um, of, of the species. And so that was sort of the early focus. And what you have here, I, I like this photo, this is from our collections. The narrow leaf form is actually the wild type. The one on the background or the right is a cultivar called Richard which is a, a cytochimera. It's actually, uh, you may have heard of variegated plants where you have a green, uh, green leaf with a white margin. Well, in this particular case, a cytochimera, you have um, the margin is, is gonna be diploid or tetraploid and the inside tissue is gonna be uh, tetraploid. You can't tell that. Obviously there's an expression on the leaf, uh, but we use flow cytometry to, to count the chromosomes and show that, hey, look, uh, this is a cytochimera. It's important from a breeding standpoint, but nonetheless, the point was we had this great collection we could use. Harlindii, the species, um, was harboring some, some resistance. So what do we have of this in cultivation? Well, it turns out we had almost nothing in cultivation. And when you looked really closely, the three accessions that we had from China were all collected from cultivation. They were not even collected in the wild. They were, one was collected at a hotel, maybe two were at a hotel, and one was in a pot. And so Frank Meyer, if you read this, um, doesn't show here, but this one came in as a pot. He called it Buxus sempervirens at the time, but this is actually Buxus uh, harlindii. Uh, he talks about uh, this plant. So he introduced Buxus harlindii. We actually have those plants uh, still in cultivation. We've maintained them all this time. Now, wow, if we didn't have those, we wouldn't have known that harlindii had any source of tolerance. So that's informing in part future efforts in boxwood, right? What should we go and collect? This is where herbaria come in very handy. So we don't have living collections. Let's look at what we have. So you look at Bux's harlindii. Uh, these were from herbarian specimens in China when Joe Kirkbride and I went. And you could see this amazing diversity. This is actually from the type location, which is where it was first collected and described. Uh, but when you, um, I guess I don't have those pictures, but there's tremendous variation in there. And so that can inform where you go to China to collect new provenances of Buxus harlindii or Buxus seneca or Buxus microphylla or coriana or um, henryi, whatever the, the species or, or correct nomenclature is, uh, and, and bring them back into cultivation. Now, this is interesting to come back to jungle gardens because while walking around jungle gardens a number of years ago um, at the request of their botanist, uh, I stumbled on this thing, which looks like Buxus harlindii or a hybrid with harlindii. That's an old plant grown in the collections. Uh, I don't think we've ever gotten cutting material of this, but Fred, if you guys are still doing DNA work, it'd be nice to get this plant because um, it may be an early introduction or another introduction. But uh, again, a boxwood, you have to remember this, a boxwood that grows on Avery Island in the bayou of, south, uh, of, of Southern Louisiana is an amazing boxwood for, the, for American landscape in the, in the 21st century. Uh, heat tolerant, uh, soil tolerance is great. Also one that we need to get uh, from Kunming is a columnar form I saw when we were over there in 2013. So, oh, here's the variation in boxwood. Again, amazing stuff. So you think you know boxwood, but we don't. Um, so again, a plant that took 100 years 
to really get our attention. And the reason it got our attention is because of box blight. If we never had box blight, I'm not sure uh, we would have actually been breeding boxwood, to be honest. So this has been heavily focused on plants from Asia, plants from those early introductions. And so I thought I need to balance it a little bit and just point out a couple of things that, and I would challenge people maybe in the chat for the plant geeks and gardeners. Um, what is a plant that you can think of that led to an aha moment that we wouldn't have? And so I gave a couple examples here. So um, we have wonderful natives in, 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 in the United States eastern United States, um, great diversity to work from. And so something as simple as summer sweet, Clethera onifolia, which is a great native, you didn't, it wasn't like widespread. I mean, it was grown, you had a few cultivars, even we got into the breeding program uh, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, so they were there, but there was a game changer. And one of those game changers was hummingbird, which would have been introduced in the late 18, uh, 1980s. Um, by Fred Galloway, I believe, uh, down in Georgia. And so this was a compact floriferous form. Now the industry said, that's something that will sell in a pot. So uh, I put some other examples, diavelas. No one cared about diavelas uh, uh, until the natives uh, plant movement a little bit, and then it was being grown and you had a, a few selections. But if you look at the background of the plant patents that are being done on the Kodiak series and other diavela, the game changer was Troho Black, uh, and which actually we brought a plant back in 2007 from the Netherlands. And so, um, it, but it was being passed around by plant geeks at the time. So again, all of the Kodiak series kind of comes from Troho Black, maybe from another one, El Madigal. Uh, Fothagilla, witch alder, two species, three species, new species in the United States. It was there, you could get it, people sold it, but the game changer was Mount Airy, a hybrid, uh, selected uh, by happenstance by Dr. Durr. Itia virginica, Virginia sweet spire, same thing. If it wasn't for Henry's garnet, we wouldn't be talking to this day about Henry's garnet here, a great planting at, at Longwood Gardens in fall color. Even Nyssa, uh, and, and uh, I think Nyssa sabbatica, underappreciated. It wasn't until people got tired of red maples and were looking for red fall color. Production issues changed uh, on how to grow Nyssa. Um, and then you had a cultivar like Heyman Red or Red Rage from Mike Heyman that sort of opened people's minds to a clonally propagated black gum uh, for the nursery industry. And then a really good one, I think, is uh, a nine bark, Physocarpus opulifolis, Mon Low, or trademarked as Diabolo, uh, or sold as Diabolo. Uh, this came out of Europe, uh, and you took a green member of the Rosaceae family that was kind of cool, was a great native plant, didn't have much market value, but now you find a purple foliage form and boom, people go crazy. The, the, it's an easy plant to breed. You've got that, even with the old yellow cultivar, even though it had been passed around, no one really cared about yellow, you want purple in the landscape. So then you got hybrids. And so these are sort of some game changers. Um, here's Physocopus uh, diabolo right here. Interesting, I showed this because it, it was a sport, so it's reverting. So, uh, and one last native that I have a hand in, and I, so I like to tell this story um, because of uh, a number of reasons, but so bear with me as we wrap up. So uh, speaking of plants that were ignored, plants that were right in front of us, things that we could have taken about, but it took some, some vision and some creativity to say, or the time was correct um, to, to take advantage of it. And so, Look up Raffinesk. He was a, a botanist in the United States, among other things. He was a polymath, polyglot, and pauper. He died as a, uh, in a pauper's grave. As a, you can look up the story on whether or not he was uh, in his grave or not. Uh, he was a one-time professor at Transylvania University in Kentucky. Uh, at one point, he named more plants than anyone else other than Linnaeus, I think. Now, he was also uh, sort of gaslit for that. So the botanist of his day said, Raffinesk, you're crazy. You're naming too many plants. You're publishing them um, uh, in, in newspapers. You're not going the scientific route. And in particular, one of the people that really just could not stand him was Asa Gray at Harvard. Now, if you have the, the, the leading foremost botanist in the United States at Harvard who doesn't like you, well, guess what? You weren't gonna, you weren't gonna get recognized. And so um, there was even a famous joke where John James Audubon, the ornithologist, met Raffinesque 
and made up a bird spotting story just to tease Raffiness. And then he went and wrote a new species description uh, later from a conversation with, with Audubon, even though Audubon was doing it out of spite or just for fun. Uh, and so he was not very particularly well respected. However, uh, in the 21st century with modern genetics, it's turning out that he has been right more times than others. He's a famous splitter. Uh, so he is sort of, his light is starting to come through, but he was gaslit by, um, maybe not the right term, but he was blackballed by uh, the botanists of the time. If you grow up with arrowwood in the Eastern United States, like I did, it is named after Viburnum, Viburnum raffinesque randomly. I say all that because uh, Raffinesque published in um, the early 1800s, a new species of hydrangea called, uh, it wasn't new, it was a new form of a hydrangea, uh, but basically is what we now know as hydrangea arborescens forma carnea. So he names this, uh, and I wanna give this straight. He names this in around mm, early 1800s. And, um, well, I don't actually have it in here. So uh, early 1800s, he names it. So Rader, who is a horticultural taxonomist at Arnhem R. Um, and uh, again, up at Harvard, uh, it writes a famous work on sort of a synonymy of all these names that have been produced in, in horticulture as a reference for people on which names are good or species are good. In his manual of cultivated trees and shrubs uh, or his checklist, his bibliography checklist. In that article, he takes Raff's work, uh, in that book, he takes Raff's name and says it's no good, it's illegitimate. Even though there's others that he recognized. He recognizes the sterile form of hydrangea arborescens, the mop head types. He recognizes a few other forms, but he chooses to not recognize Raffinesque. One, there's no herbarium specimens, but two, you can't help but think that he says, this guy was crazy. I'm not gonna take his word on it. We're gonna say it doesn't exist. Well, it does exist. Uh, and it wasn't until 1986 that a botanist in Tennessee resurrected, hey, look, this is a real thing. Like you can botanize and find pink form of hydrangea arborescence. Uh, and so uh, this is a form that I took uh, up in the meadows of Dan. And so, uh, so this gets resurrected as a valid name. Now, again, you go back to Raider's manual. In there, you have mop head hydrangea arborescence, like what we would know as Annabelle now, which is a form, and the pink form. And people reading that say pink isn't real or haven't seen it. For 100 years, they've been reading that. Nature, uh, the good thing is uh, nature doesn't read books. And so the pink form was real. And so uh, it wasn't until the late 1990s um, or 1980s, Don Jacobs found a pink form called Eco Pink, um, Eco -Pink Puff, uh, which was growing at, uh, in North Carolina. And then um, Wester Falls, which is one that I found on the Nantahala uh, when I was a grad student, that this was then sort of connected with the modern need for cold hardy flowering hydrangeas. And the light bulbs were going off and saying, well, what if we had just crossed pink hydrangea arborescence? And so um, these, are, these are forms that, that were pink. Uh, Wester Falls on the left, eco pink uh, puff is not shown. Actually, in left is actually on the side of the road. On the right is a later digital image. And so here we go. Now you have an entire program uh, kind of wrapped up at UGA, but Tom Ranney has run with this um, from NC State. And now you have these incredible pink mop heads. And the, to me, the funny part is just the data, the information was right in front of us. Uh, and we could have been doing this 100 years ago. But imagine if Raffiness hadn't been uh, sort of blackballed by Asa Gray. And again, to wrap this up, because I know we got four minutes and there's time for questions, bring it back to the National Arboretum and long-term and just sort of fun. We're coming up to azalea season. Um, uh, Mount Hamilton will be in bloom shortly. If you haven't been here, today is great. Magnolias, the cherries are coming. The mumes have been great, but the azaleas are coming in. And Dorset is uh, a selection of a, of a Camp Farii um, uh, azalea that uh, actually came from a collection by Dorset in 1930 uh, in Japan. And uh, Morrison, they received these at Glendale. Uh, they would have been grown off uh, from seed uh, and introduced into the breeding program of Morrison at Glendale. And um, 
ultimately was selected and named after the explorer at Dorset because it was a really good red or sort of a red color, but it reblooms. And this reblooming trait is not a new thing. It wasn't just a first time happened was in Dorset. Uh, it actually has been documented by the Japanese for more than four, almost 400 years. If you go to Ito's text of 1692 on azalea culture in Japan, uh, he classifies reblooming azaleas as four season azaleas. They bloom in spring and summer and then fall and winter. And so he called it four seasons. And the name for that is shiki. And so in that text, you'll see something called akashiki, which is red four season. None of this would have been available had Dr. John Creech, the director of the National Arboretum, not had collections in Japan, hit it off with um, a, a Konami Kato, who was an azalea expert, and they decided to translate this ancient text to bring it to the world to say, hey, look, the Japanese were doing this for a long time. And in it, John Creech makes a very interesting statement. For those interested in fall blooming azaleas, the fact that the early Japanese breeders not only developed this type, but also extended it with color forms and doubleness should be of interest. That was written in his foreword in, in 1984. Flash forward, where are we today with reblooming azaleas? Well, I can tell you, you probably already know, but you probably didn't know this connection. So there is Dr. John Creech on the right, receiving in 2006 a Distinguished Service Award from the American uh, uh, Azalea Society and the American Rhododendron Society. And the gentleman he, he's shaking hands with is Buddy Lee, uh, who was the president at the time. But Buddy Lee is the azalea breeder that brought you the encore azaleas, the re-blooming azaleas. And it turns out that him and John were pretty good friends uh, and such good that near the end of John's life when they were visiting, he said, you need to keep, keep at it. And here's John Creech giving uh, Buddy Lee a plant of US, this is a USNA introduction. Uh, and uh, it's uh, probably NA40829, something that Creech brought back from Japan on one of his last trips. He said it was near death at the Arboretum so he dug it up and took it home to nourish it back to health. And we have a cutting of this plant and Buddy Lee has used this in his breeding program. And so I'm gonna end there. Uh, plants have a funny circuitous, circuitous route from Curio to Champion. Uh, and sometimes it takes uh, uh, really great connections and just giving away plants to have uh, great plants for everyone. So um, I will stop there, Craven mm -hmm. and and uh, hopefully we have time for questions. Um. Richard, uh, this is Kathy speaking. Uh, Richard, this is fascinating. I've already got a list of like five plants that I'm going to go look for for my spring garden. So thank you so much. Um, we don't have a whole lot of questions, but there is one here. Um, and it is related to the fact that what you've been talking about, these imported plants and cultivars, they're not natives. So the question is, what do they provide to native insects and animals? And have any of them become invasive? Right. Uh, so good question. Uh, what do non-native plants do for native uh, native creatures? Uh, and the question is, they often do a lot. Um, but the question um, is, do, are they doing it better? Maybe they're thinking, are they doing it better than 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 the natives? That research is ongoing. We've done that here at the, at the Arboretum with Dr. Greenstone, the plots we used to have. Uh, the verdict is mostly out. Uh, is not mostly out. It's mostly in. Yes, native plants. If your if your your value judgment in planting is what you can do to support natural ecosystems and and wildlife, then yeah, your your chances are you're better off with um, native plants. But I think the corollary is that is not to assume that all non-natives are bad or doing bad things. And so mm -hmm. certainly there are ones that are invasive. Um, Viburnum macrocephalum ketilarii, the 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 wild type, it does seed in our collection. So. Um, you certainly uh, won't see me talk about just growing the species uh, because it's fertile, but you know its incorporation into a breeding program is the best way to utilize it. And so uh, we do have some bad players and we don't promote those. Uh, we do have Sam Drogby, I think is his last name. Dr. Drogby uh, was here on the grounds uh, sweeping his nets, looking at um, bee populations and relatives on natives and non-natives. So he'll have data on that. Um, and so, uh, um, yeah, I mean, generally, I think I don't want to speak too much about the entomology of it, but it's not that they can't support, it's just do they support better? And um, 
if that's your value judgment, then then stick with natives. Great. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I and we're about at one o'clock. Actually, we're just over a little bit. So I think we're going to end here. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you for your support, Dr. Olson. This was fascinating. I think we need to get you back out here um, uh, more often. <laughs>